Good afternoon. This being Palm Sunday, please turn with us to the 21st chapter in the book of Matthew. We want to preach today upon the Lord's riding into Jerusalem. Matthew chapter 21, and before we get started, we want to open up with a word of prayer. Father God, we bow before you today, good Lord, and we just ask you, Father, to take us in your hand. Lord, we pray, dear God, that as we preach the word, Father, the Holy Spirit would just speak to each and every one of us here, dear God. The Lord, we pray, Father, for your people, that they be lifted up, and that, God, if there be anyone here today with us that is lost, God, we pray they would hear the calling of the Holy Spirit upon their heart. Lord, that they would take heed, and God, come to you by faith in your Son. We ask it all in his name, and amen. Matthew chapter 21, starting at the first verse. <clears throat> Bible says, And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem, and were come to Bethpage unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus to disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway you shall find an ass tied, and a colt with her. Loose them, and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, ye shall say, The Lord hath needed them. And straightway he will send them. All this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass, and a colt, the foal of an ass. And we'll stop reading right there for just a moment today. The Lord riding here into Jerusalem so very close to the cross of Calvary. And you know, that's what the entire Bible is all about. It's all about the cross. When you go to Genesis, or if you start Revelation and you go... You always find the cross throughout all of the entire scripture. Now here the Lord is coming into Jerusalem to present himself as king. And the word of God says that this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet in the fourth verse. You know, one thing that's amazing about the Lord and amazing about God our Father and the word of God is that God gives us enough evidence to know that this is true and yet leaves out enough so that we still must accept things by faith. For example, did you know that Jesus fulfilled over 320 prophecies while he walked upon this earth? Now there's some that still have yet to be fulfilled. That is the rapture of the church, the coming, him sexually sitting on the throne of David. And we'll talk about some of those in just a little bit. But someone who's a mathematician, obviously much smarter than me. I'm not a mathematician. Just ask my wife and my kids. But someone who is very smart did the math on this. And in order for uh, this to be a fake, the chances of Jesus not being the Christ, the chances of Jesus not being the Son of God, the chances of Jesus doing all of this and not being who he said he was, fulfilling over 320 prophecies, was one in an absolutely astronomical number. Like, I don't even know the number. I'm just going to say 10 trillion, but it was bigger than that. That's the odds. In other words, God here has given us these things and shown us these things. Jesus has fulfilled prophecies thousands of years before his coming. He came and he fulfilled those very things. Many, many different ones, and he fulfilled them in the absolute minutest detail possible. So the word of God comes and reminds us that Jesus here told them to go and, and get the donkey so that he may ride upon it. In that day and time, we might think, well, why didn't you pick a big stallion to ride on a nice big horse? Well, in, in that day and time, it was common that kings rode on donkeys. That was the common animal during this time period that a king would ride on. Now, we understand, and looking back, and we'll, we'll talk about this for just a moment, but there was great political strife in Jerusalem and in Israel. Rome had come in and, and conquered, so they was under Roman rule. Now, when I say Rome came in and conquered, it was actually a, a falling away from Babylon to different kingdoms that had, had overtaken Israel. Israel had been overtaken for years. But now Rome was in charge, if you will. And people have been looking back upon the Old Testament scriptures. How that one day God would send the Messiah. That one day God would send his man that would come and would sit on the throne of David. 
and would rule all of Israel, and Israel would be free. Jesus here is presenting himself as king at this moment. But thank God he didn't come at this time to go to the throne of David. You say, what do you mean? Well, let's, let's keep reading. And so as they do all of this, it says in the sixth verse, And the disciples went, did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ass and the colt, and put on them their clothes, and they set him thereon. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. They had looked forever for this one to come. And you can see their excitement. You see, they recognized through what Jesus did that he was the one to come. But they didn't understand everything about the Old Testament. They really liked the scriptures that said a Messiah would come and sit upon the throne. That Israel would be free and he would rule with a rod of iron and there would be peace. They liked that part. But they forgot about scriptures like Isaiah chapter 53. who said, all we like sheep have gone astray and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus coming now to present himself as king and so many people excited putting down the, the palm leaves, putting down the branches giving, making pathway for the king to come. You see, what led them to this, this decision, what led them to believe that Christ was king and he is, was the things that he did. The things that Jesus did in his life were things that no other man has ever done. He gave sight to the blind. He gave hearing to the dead. He gave speech to the dumb. He raised the dead. We talk about those things many times, but as we have also said many times, those things were not why Jesus came. Yes, Jesus came, and I believe as we've seen the Lord healing people, as we've seen the Lord giving sight to the blind, as we see the Lord raising the dead, I think what we are seeing, because the Word of God tells us that Christ is the very image of God here for us to see. I think what we see by Jesus doing all those things is we see that this old sin-cursed world that we live in, the things that we go through, the illnesses we face, the death that happens, I think we see was not God's intended plan for me. It wasn't the way God wanted things to go. But you see, the Word of God tells us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible tells us there in the book of Genesis chapter 3 that mankind fell. That we chose our own way. And I think probably all of us here can attest to that. Probably none of us here got saved the very first time God called us. Probably not. We all chose our own way. But thank God all of us here who are saved can say God still saved us when we came to it. God's desire is to bring humanity back to him. And you see, that's why Jesus came. All of us here have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, the book of Romans says. All of us here needs God's grace. All of us here needs God's forgiveness. And God hands it out freely and open. God's arms are wide open to whosoever will, the word of God says. As a matter of fact, the last chapter of the last book of the Bible, one of the last things it says in the book of Revelation. And whosoever will may come and take the water of life freely. Whosoever will. Whosoever wants to. Now as Jesus came, they expected him to come and to sit on the throne of David. And as he came into Jerusalem in the 10th verse, the Bible says, And when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved saying, Who is this? That's a fantastic question. It's the question I want to pose to you today. Who is Jesus to you? What does he mean to you? Jesus said to the disciples, he asked them one time, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Well, some say that you're Elijah, some say that you're that prophet, or a prophet. And then Jesus looked to them and said, Who do you say that I am? You see, the world today, and, and we see it plainly in front of our own eyes, the world today has lost sight of who the Lord Jesus Christ is. And we see our world going in a dark, dark way because of losing that sight of who he is. 
But regardless of all of that, it doesn't matter what the world thinks of who Jesus is. Who do you think he is? Who is he to you? You see, when you stand before God on that great day of judgment, God isn't going to ask you how good you were. He is going to ask you, what did you do with my son? What did you do with my son? So who is Jesus to you? The multitude said, this is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. Now, here at this direct moment, I'm sure the crowd was expecting him <laughs> to go and to sit on the throne of David. I'm sure they was expecting him to go at this moment, sit on that throne, release them from Roman rule and everything. It was going to be a big uprising and everything was going to be just fine. But as we said earlier, Jesus chose a different path. His path at this time was not to go and to sit upon the throne of David. Now, don't get me wrong. One day it will be. The Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is coming back one day. The Bible tells us in the book of Revelation, the first chapter, the seventh verse, it says this. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall will because of him, even so. Amen. The Bible tells us that Jesus is coming back and he is going to do those very things. But here his path was not to the throne. Here his path was to the cross and to show us that God desires a relationship with us. Notice what he did when he got there. It says in the 12th verse, And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. We say this so many times, but it's so vitally important, especially if you're lost, to understand. God isn't interested in religion. He's interested in a relationship. He wants your trust. He wants your faith. He wants you to come to Him, repenting of your sins, yes, but He doesn't expect you to be perfect. No, His Son took care of all the perfection you'll ever need. He just wants you to come to Him. And so that's why Jesus first got rid of all the, the religiousness that ended up in the temple. You see, we know throughout the Old Testament there was sacrifices, but that ended up becoming a business. And church isn't a business, no. And so Jesus got rid of all of them and said unto them, It is written in the 13th verse, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. You know what prayer is? Prayer is talking to God and thinking upon God. That's what the house of God is supposed to be. And this is a special building. It is a special building. Now I know the church comes when we all come. But this is a special place to come. When we come and we, we bring all of our failures, all of our faults, all of our praises. We bring them before God. We bring who we are. And, and God wants you to come to His house and come and find out who He is. That's what prayer is. And so Jesus got rid of them. And notice what happened when He got rid of the religiousness that was there. It says in the 14th verse, And the blind and the lame came to Him in the temple, and He healed them. You know who the blind and the lame are? All of us. It's all of us. If you just come to Him, He heals you. <clears throat> I'm not saying he's going to take all your problems away. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm saying he'll save you. I'm saying he'll change you from the inside. I'm saying he'll give you a hope beyond this life. I'm saying he'll forgive you of all your sins and trespasses. See, we're, we're all blind and lame. We've all messed up. We all get tripped up. We don't know what way to go. We have a hard time getting there. And so we're all blind and lame. And, and they came to him. They came to him. Not only did they come to him, but the children come to him. You see, it doesn't matter how young you are. If you realize you need saved, then get saved. And it doesn't matter how old you are. You're not too old to get saved. It doesn't matter how bad you are. You're not bad enough that you can't get saved. And it's not. it doesn't matter how good you are because you're not good enough that you don't need saved. It's all about just coming to him. Letting go of the religion. Coming to Him just as you are. The children did it. The Bible says there in the, the 15th verse. 
And when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were sore displeased, and said unto him, Hearest thou what these say? And Jesus said unto them, Yea, have you never read, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, thou hast perfected praise? I was happy to see all the kids that came up and, and sang. And I'm always happy to see how happy the kids are when they go to Sunday school or when they come up from Sunday school. Listen, there, there's a specialness within children and a special faith within children. And children, don't think you're too young to be saved because you're not. If you want to be, the Lord will save you. Listen to me today. Don't think, as we said earlier, don't think you're, you're too bad. Don't think you're too old. Don't think you're too good. One last thought that I want to close with today. I thought about this. I heard this this week, and I had never, ever thought about this before um, until I read it this time. We are coming up on Easter very fastly, a week away. And as we are, are gathering, getting there, obviously probably a lot of us will be reading all the accounts of everything, and of course we'll be reading about the Last Supper, the betrayal of our Lord. And many times when we think about that, we think about Judas betraying the Lord for 30 pieces of silver. It says in Matthew 26 and the 15th verse, And he said unto them, What will you give me? And I will deliver him unto you. Judas here is speaking to the chief priests. And it says, And they covenanted with him for 30 pieces of silver. I heard something this week I had never thought about before. Judas didn't sell the Lord for 30 pieces of silver. He sold himself for 30 pieces of silver. That was what took him away from Jesus. What is it that keeps you from being saved if you're here today and you're lost? The Bible says this. Jesus says, what is it profited a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What, what are you, the thing that's holding you back, that's your 30 pieces of silver. Listen, the, the Lord came to seek and to save that which was lost. The Lord came and he could have easily chosen the path to the throne, but he chose the path to the cross, the path of suffering where he would lay down on that old rugged cross, bleed and die for our sins, and on the third day rise again. If you don't know him today, I pray that you'll come know him as we stand. Thank you.